The next thing we'll cover is when are things abnormal? Let's talk about where we hear those sounds normally. So um, you can either have sounds that are absent or decreased. Let's just make this simplified, right? So um, absent is when we don't hear any breath sounds. That's never a good sign, right? Um, so it could be for a, a lot of different reasons, right? We could have air or fluid in the lungs. Um, we could have air or fluid potentially in the, in, you know, the pleural space or a pneumothorax where there is no, um, you know, no ventilation, right? Or very limited ventilation because of those changes in pleural pressure or you know, pneumothorax. And a normal pneumothorax, right? There, the pleural space is completely equalized. Uh, the pressures are equalized. The atmospheric, there's really no ventilation, right? Um, especially like a, a severe tension pneumothorax. Or if there's just really increased chest wall thickness, or if there's a lot of adipose tissue, sometimes it's hard to hear over a really obese patient because, again, all your stethoscope is essentially is a microphone, right? So anything that's going to impact the ability for you to you know, that sound to transmit from the the structures we're listening to, right, is going to make it harder to hear. Right. Um, sometimes if patients are like really overinflated, um, like an emphysema, it's just going to distort the sound. They're going to be filtered out by the by the lung tissue and the air in the in the lung tissue. Right. So you might have is absent or decreased sounds for a lot of different reasons. Right. Uh, there can be increased increased breath sounds. So again, normally lung sounds in the periphery are vesicular. That's that's that soft rustling sound you know it's not super turbulent when we get down there it's more laminar flow remember going back to like cardiovascular physiology laminar flow when it runs through a, a tube doesn't produce a lot of vibration doesn't produce a lot of sound same kind of concept here with the lungs where we have that laminar flow of air in our lower segments it should be kind of quiet right it's not going to be super loud so if we hear um bronchovesicular sounding sounds right, or louder sounds in the periphery, that's not normal. That could be due to a lot of different things. Could be due to a consolidation, could be due to inflammation or, or changes in the lungs. Now, a, typically what we hear, or the typical presentation, now remember our, our consolidations which occur with pneumonias and stuff like that. If we listen directly over a consolidation, typically because there's, you know, a lot of that fluid in those areas, um, we don't hear anything, right, because there's just no ventilation. On the periphery of the borders of that consolidation, the sounds are a little bit more increased. So um, you know, that's why it's super important to do a very thorough assessment because you, know, you may actually hear, you know, again, on the borders of a consolidation, you'll hear that increased sound. And then directly over the, the, the consolidation, you actually might not hear much sound at all. Okay, So just, again, um, normal in the periphery, we have those vesicular low-pitched sounds. When we have, you know, louder sounds in the periphery, that's never a normal sign. If we hear bronchovesicular sounds in areas that it should be um, vesicular, that's not normal. But, and again, make sure you're actually listening over the lung segment, right, and that we're not so close to the sternal, sternal um, borders or spine that we're actually listening over the bronchioles and not actually over the segment. So that's why you got to get really good at practicing your lo locations for auscultation, so you know that you're you're not biasing your test by giving yourself a false positive, right? So um, there are also adventitious sounds. So now these aren't you know um, you know bronchovesicular sounds heard in a segment, right? These are different sounds that you might hear depending on certain conditions. So we've got crackles, ronchis, strider, um, and pleural rubs. So crackles. Um, or also known as rails, result from the popping open of the alveoli when they're compressed by fluid. Now that could be compressed due to fluid, like in a pulmonary edema, could be due to mucus, or if just someone's just been laying on their back for a long time and it's not ventilating those segments, like maybe someone after surgery, um, and they pop open when we take a deep breath, right? So it's, uh, it sounds like Velcro popping open, and I'll play um, you know, what that sounds like here. And again, you get this kind of Velcro rice crispy sound because basically, again, the alveoli were compressed. As we breathe in and draw some volume, they pop back open. Okay, so that's kind of what you're hearing um, with auscultation. Now, there are two general types uh, non cardiogenic, which would be, you know, something that, you know, maybe is a pneumonia, you know, not a pneumonia, but like a, you know, atelectasis where there's that temporary airway collapse, uh, maybe due to a, um, you know, due to, 
a mucus plug or someone's not just taking deep breaths. So a non-cardiogenic crackles, uh, if someone coughs and those, 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 uh, those crackles go away, you know, that's non-cardiogenic. Now cardiogenic, which we can see with like pulmonary edema, which can result after heart failure um, of some kind, um, we would often see this bilaterally. So non-cardiogenic, we typically see, you know, unilaterally. Cardiogenic, we more often see a bilateral, but the hallmark sign is these do not resolve with coughing or deep breaths. Now, we call them cardiogenic because often we see this related to heart failure, but there, again, there could also be other causes of these, you know, crackles not going away. Um, and interestingly enough, these typically resolve with sidelining because basically what we're doing is mo mobilizing fluid out of, out of the way. It's not due to like compression um, from like, you know, laying on them or mucus. It's like, fluid in the lungs, right? So that's never a good sign. So a cardiogenic and car, non-cardiogenic non and cardiogenic causes. Uh, ronchi, which we typically see um, in patients with like asthma, they, they signify uh, inflammation. So basically when we have, you know, inflamed or irritated airways, they get, uh, the sounds get a little bit more turbulent, right? So we get this, you know, this sound almost like we're forcing air through a smaller lumen. Um, and it creates this wheezing noise, right? Or uh, we also often call ronchi, okay? Um, these, again, have a cardiogenic versus non-cardiogenic presentation. If they go away of coughing, we're thinking that it could be, you know, just a mucus plug. And if they don't go away, you know, it could be a cardiogenic cause. Um, again, those are just terms we use. It could be, you know, other reasons that, you know, the, the changes are fixed. So I'll play uh, what these sound like in it here. So it's, again, you know, wheezing-like noise. And again, we typically hear this during expiration when you have the air, the air is really being forced through those inflamed, irritated airways. Now, uh, strider, right, it's a wheeze-like sound, but we typically hear this in like the upper airways, um, you know, and maybe even over the trachea. This is a sound basically um, if like someone's got an obstruction in those areas. So I don't know if you guys have, um, you know, ever seen like a kid um, with really, you know, bad, you know, uh, croup or strep, they might get this sound. Um, you could also see this, you know, if someone's got like a, uh, like a, like a, like a kid is another example. Kids got like something stuck in their upper airways, like a toy, a Lego or something like that. Um, you can get this sound as well. It's obstruction in the upper airways. Um, so I'll play this here. So again, that's caused by a foreign body, typically in the esophagus or airway. And again, you know, thinking of signs, we often see this: the kid, like who swallows a foreign body, like a toy or something, and it's stuck in their airway, and you hear the hear this sound. Um, the next sound we'll cover is a pleural rub. So a pleural rub, um, you know, again, it's that sound. It sounds similar to what we hear with a pericardial friction rub. It's basically in a pleural rub. Um, now the pleura are inflamed or irritated, or what you see with a pleural effusion, sometimes we can hear this. Um, it's this coarse grating sound. Um, the sound on this one's not super great, so I'd make sure if you, if you have it, download it and listen um, on, your, on your headsets. Um, and you know, a way to kind of symbolize what this, what this sounds like, if you take a stethoscope and run your fingers over the back, you'll hear this kind of rubbing noise. That's basically what a, a pleural rub sort of sounds like. rubbing friction like noise. And that's it right there. Yeah. Right, so that is a pleural rub. So I have a chart here just go over some differences uh, that you might hear uh, for different conditions. Uh, you know, just to kind of kind of you know clue you know the patterns that you might see with, with certain conditions with these sounds. So uh, the next thing we'll cover are voice sounds. We touched on breath sounds. So breath sounds, again, are things that we hear when the patient's just breathing through their mouth. They're not, they're not doing anything other than just breathing through their mouth, right? Voice sounds is auscultation and while the patient is speaking, hence the term voice. They're using their voice or talking. So as a reminder, in normal lung segments, um, whisper, you know, whisper sounds or even just talking, you know, that's going to be filtered out of it by the lung tissue. You're not going to hear sounds distinctly. With a whispered song, you might not hear anything if they're, if they're whispering. 
right? So if we hear changes from what we would expect, that would indicate, you know, maybe there's something going on here, maybe a consolidation, right? So we actually think voice sounds might be a little bit more sensitive um, and maybe even more specific um, to picking up consolidations, right? Because there's a little bit more of a sensitive test. Um, so typically you would start maybe with your breath sounds. If you hear something a little bit funky, you know, have them call, assess it again. If you hear it again, maybe do some voice sounds. All right, so the, there's three that you can utilize. Whisper patriloquy, right? So you have a patient whisper. Um, and typically you give the patient a stereotyped word that's really easy to remember and repeat um, with the same kind of phonation. So you can tell them, you know, to repeat one, two, three, or 99, or, uh, you know, fire truck. Um, for whisper patriloquy, you'd have them whisper that, that phrase. So you'd say, can you whisper 99? And you have them whisper 99 as you listen over different segments. Again, normally whispered sounds are almost completely filtered out by the lungs. You shouldn't hear anything. In an abnormal uh, uh, situation, the sounds would be more clear and distinct, especially over the borders of a consolidation. Baron company, um, in this time, in this assessment, you have the patient just say that stereotyped word. So in whispered patriloquy, they're whispering the phrase and you're listening. In bronc company, they're just saying it. So you'd have them say 99, fire truck, or 99, or 123. So you're listening, have them say 99, 99 as you're listening. Typically, the sounds are muffled. Um, again, they're filtered up by the lungs. And someone with a consolidation or infiltration of some kind that sounds going to, again, be more clear and distinct, and that's not a normal finding. That is abnormal if you can hear that sound very distinctly. Um, and you can practice this on yourself by just listening to your, to your lungs as you're talking. You're going to hear this kind of muffled noise, and that's normal. Now, egophony, a little bit different. So this time, you have the patient say the word e, and when you listen over the lungs, that sound should still sound like e. An abnormal sign is that that sound of E is changed to a sound that sounds like A, A. So it's a little bit different. So normally you should hear E and it would change with a consolidation or infiltration to A, okay, or A, okay? So there's videos of these to practice as well. Another assessment you can utilize, look at, uh, you know, consolidations, this is a little bit less specific even, is tactile fremitus. So basically what this does is you do the same thing, you give them a repeated or a stereotyped word, like one, two, three, or 99, or fire truck, and then you're feeling over different segments. Uh, normally the vibrations produced by that sound that they're, that they're producing should be symmetrical side to side. Now, if there's a patient with a consolidation, it can cause that vibration to be increased, okay? Um, so it could be, you know, due to maybe a consolidation, a pleural fusion, or anything that's going to affect uh, ventilation or transmission. So uh, this is basically the setup that you'll utilize, right? You have your hand over the, over the rib cage. Um, you can use a karate chop technique where you're just using your thinner eminences. You can use a flat palm. Always just use discretion depending on the patient, especially if you're feeling the anterior segments. And I have videos for you, uh, of these for you to practice. Now, again, it's imperative, remember, your hands are not super sensitive to subtle changes. So, you know, what you're really looking for here with tactile fremitus is symmetry. Because you don't necessarily know if this is an increased vibration on one side or a decrease. You just know there's a difference. Um, and you always follow this up with lung segment auscultation. Tactile fremitus is a nice starting point because uh, you'll feel differences, but you won't know if it's, you know, increase on one side or decrease on the other side. Uh, depending on what's going on. We typically say there's an increased vibration on the side that there is a consolidation, um, but again, always follow up with a um, auscul auscultation. Uh, another assessment you can utilize to look at, you know, consolidations is immediate percussion. So normally when we're kind of, um, when we're percussing the lungs, the sound should be resonant, like you're banging on a table. Areas of increased density um, so atelectasis or consolidation will sound dull, right? They're like, again, like imagine what's happening with the consolidation. We're filling those segments with fluid, right? So that'd be almost analogous if you were percussing your quads. They're in a relaxed state. You're not going to, it's not going to be super loud, right? So the sound will be dull. Um, as an area of decreased density, right? So you, if you would see an emphysema and the lungs are hyperinflated, the sound will be hyper resonant. So that'd be almost analogous if you have puffed out cheeks and you're 
flicking your, your cheats, okay? Um, so again, you know, there's some technique here. You, got, you really wanna make sure you're using your, uh, you know, your non-dominant hand to, to percuss onto. You're not percussing directly right onto the lung segment. Um, you're percussing onto your fingernails with your, with your middle finger, okay? And then the last thing we'll cover is tracheal position, right? And we have videos for this one as well. Uh, key things for this, we're gonna use this uh, when we're, uh, we're concerned that a patient may have a pneumothorax and we wanna see if the tracheal position is, is in midline. So the patient, you're gonna have them flex their neck to relax the strap muscles. You're gonna place your finger in the suprasternal notch and then you're gonna feel on side to side if you feel something blocking the advancement of your finger. And again, remembering, um, you know, we should have equal sides on, you know, equal spaces on either side. Um, if it's deviated, right, the most common cause is, a, is that pneumothorax. And again, and the trachea will move away from the side of the lesion. Uh, another technique that you're going to utilize is uh, you can use this like two fingers on the, on the uh, sternal notch and then probe with your finger. Um, you know, whatever you feel is more comfortable for your patient. Um, and again, I don't even actually think this example did a super good job of relaxing the strap muscles because again, you want those muscles to relax. So you can have you know a little bit easier way or easier passage of that finger um, you know, to the side of the of the trachea. Okay, so again, if it deviates, if you if you uh, you know are feeling on the right side, right, and you can't get your finger in that space. You know, it's blocking. You're feeling that trachea in the way. It means it's deviated to the right side, which means we have a lesion you know, on this left side. Remember, we have, especially with the pneumothorax, pressure high to low, it's pushing segments um, on the, you know, non-injured side, which are still at a lower pressure. So this, the trachea will deviate, deviate away from the side of the lesion, All right? So that was a chest examination in a very, a, a, in a nutshell, we, again, we went over some um, changes that you can see with consolidations or infiltrations. Again, um, you always wanna be systematic with your, with your approach. Again, you know, start with your, you know, you know, maybe your your tactile fremitus. Get a very rough assessment. Follow up with breath sounds. If you hear something a little bit more funky, you can follow up with your voice sounds. Uh, but you can develop an algorithm that works best for you. The most important thing is to be systematic.